Hello, everybody. My name is Mindy Mandel, and I am here with Jacob and Jed. And our plan today is to finish up Plato's Ion. We are using the Loeb Classical Library Edition. And for those of you who don't have the paper version, there is a PDF link in the description box. So that said, I'll do just a little bit of review of what we were looking at last time. Let me put that up here. First of all, there was a question Jed had asked where it says apprehending his thought. He asked me if that was nous. And I was looking at the Greek, but I'm not fluent in Greek. And I saw the word dianoia, and I was thinking that might be what was being used, but I wasn't sure because there's also understanding is here in this paragraph. So I checked on that over the week, and it is indeed dianoia, not nous. Um, so I just wanted to make that point, and then I want to jump to what we were talking about last time. Um, okay, so they're talking about art. And uh, Socrates was talking about how to define an artist. Now, we, it was clear that what he was talking about has more to do with judging art rather than doing it. It is, of course, possible that the same person who does the art can be the judge, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. What he's calling an artist is in regards to that ability to judge. And there were three things that he pointed out. So first was skilled in pointing out the successes and failures among the works. And the second was skilled in expounding the successes of Daedalus and others. And then skilled in expounding the art of these people. And so we talked a little bit last week about what all of that might mean. So we have that idea in mind as we go then to this. We ended with the speech of Socrates's, where he was laying out this image of the muse or the gods being like a, a magnet that these rings attach to. And the first ring that attaches would be the poet. But he says here, the muse inspires men herself. And then by means of these inspired persons, the inspiration spreads to others and it holds them in a connected chain. So you have this image of many links attached to, the, to this magnet. And we see that the poet is the first ring. So a poet is a light and winged and sacred thing and is unable ever to indict until he's been inspired and put out of his senses and his mind is no longer in him. Every man, while he retains possession of that, is powerless to indict a verse or chant an oracle. And he called this divine dispensation. So someone like Homer, that first ring that's attached to the magnet, is a person with divine dispensation who is out of their senses when they create. So when you're in your right mind, you cannot do so. You cannot create kind of writings that Homer and others had come up with. And then he ended with this, this little speech of his, ended with saying that the poets, people, um, Oh, sorry. Um, so the poets such as Homer are merely the interpreters of the gods, according as each is possessed by one of the heavenly powers. And so we got that first ring last week. And today we're going to get the next two rings and we're going to see where Ion fits in. Okay, so that's where we ended off last time. Either of you have any thoughts or questions from what we did last time before we go on? Okay, so then we'll jump back into the reading. Um, maybe it worked well for the two of you to read, if you don't mind doing so again. And then I'll just jump in as, as necessary or as convenient. So um, we'll pick up here where we ended off. Who wants to be Ion this week, by the way? Your Ion, again, is that okay, Jacob? Right, your sure. Socrates? Okay. Okay. Um, so Socrates made this long speech, and then he asks Ion, do you not think my statement true, Ion? 
Sorry, what page is this? Sorry. Sorry, this is on page 425. Upon my word, I do. For you somehow touch my soul with your words, Socrates. And I believe it is by divine dispensation that good poets interpret to us these utterances of the gods. And you, Rhapsodes, for your part, interpret the utterances of the poets? Again, your words are true. And so you act as interpretators of interpretators? Precisely. Stop now, and tell me, Ion, without reserve, what I may choose to ask you. When you give a good recitation, and specifically thrill your audience, either with the lay of Odysseus leaping forth onto the threshold, revealing himself to the suitors, and pouring out the arrows before his feet, or of Achilles dashing at Hector, or some part of the sad story of Endomachi, or of Hecuba, or of Pram. Are you then in your senses, or are you carried out of yourself? And does your soul in an ecstasy suppose herself to be among the scenes you are describing, whether they be in Ithaca or in Troy, or as the poems may chance to place them? How vivid to me, Socrates, is this part of your proof. For I will tell you without reserve, when I relate a tale of woe, my eyes are filled with tears. And when it is of fear or awe, my hair stands on end with terror, and my heart leaps. Well now, are we to say, Ion, that such a person is in his senses at that moment, when in all the adornment of elegant attire and golden crowns he weeps at sacrifice or festival having been despoiled of none of his finery or shows fear as he stands before more than 20,000 friendly people none of whom is stripping or injuring him no upon my word not at all socrates to tell the strict truth and are you aware that your rhapsodes produce these same effects on most of the spectators also? Yes, fully aware. For I look down upon them from the platform and see them at such moments crying and turning awestruck eyes upon me and yielding to the amazement of my tale. For I have to pay the closest attention to them since... If I set them crying, I shall laugh myself because of the money I take. But if they laugh, I shall cry because of the money I lose. What does that mean? Hmm. Okay. Not sure. What is he doing in that moment? What is he describing? Is, is he caught up in the emotion of the scene? Because up above, the way he was describing it, it sounds like he's very much caught up in it. He cries along, and I relate a, a tale of woe, excuse me. My eyes are filled with tears. It sounds like he's very caught up in the emotion. Is that what he's describing here? So that he can get a paycheck. Maybe mm. he's caught up. But... What state of mind do you imagine he's in when he's doing this? Maybe the mindset of someone who's doing their job or mm -hmm. just working for, you know, for money. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Jed? Yeah, I wonder how much he can get wrapped up in something if he's paying uh, 
careful, closest attention to whether his crowd is laughing or crying. Mm. Um, yeah. It's taking his cues from others. And also reminds me of how um, a lot of um, um, grifters, right-wing grifters and stuff, uh, mm. prey on... Um, fear and anger and making people upset they know they make more money by making people upset at the liberals or the left or the woke or whatever is the daily thing um rather than making people happy and in a positive state of mind they make more money putting people in a negative state of mind for some reason hmm. yeah or think of um we don't have to get political but thinking of like for example sad movies the tearjerker movie, people, there's something cathartic, maybe, about um, having that release. And so that's the spectators. But as for Ion, he sounds, like you were saying there, kind of like the way the grifters work. He's something, there's something calculated about it, a kind of manipulation of the audience, right? He's... So he's not really caught up in it. He can't be caught up in it if this is what he's doing. Maybe above, he's, sorry, he's just saying what Socrates wants to hear, what he thinks is the right answer. But what he's saying here is very different. This is calculated. How divinely um, inspired from the gods can he be if he's following his own motivation to make money? Like, is he really being a vessel for the gods that's a question to hold on to yeah so um yeah but he does from what he says he feels something he really enjoys reciting homer but as you both pointed out this is his job and so he's treating it like a job and so we still have the question of um, Socrates had suggested maybe he's not an artist, it's divine dispensation for him as well. We're, now we're questioning if it's that either. He, maybe he's not an artist, or it's not, nor is it divine dispensation, but we've got the question. So we'll go on and see um, the next ring, the last ring here Socrates is going to give us. And are you aware that your spectator is the last of the rings which I spoke of as receiving from each other the power transmitted from the Heraclean lodestone? You, the rhapsode and actor, are the middle ring. The poet himself is the first. But it is the god who, through the whole series, draws the souls of men Whither, whithersoever he pleases, making the power of one depend on the other. And just as from the magnet, there is a mighty chain of choric, choric performers and masters and undermasters suspended from side connections from the rings that hang down from the muse. One poet is suspended from one muse, another from another. The word we use for it is possessed, but it is much the same thing, for he is held. And from these first rings, the poets are suspended, various others which are thus inspired, some by Orpheus and others by Maseus, <laughs> but the majority are possessed and held by Homer of whom you, Ion, are one, and are possessed by Homer. And so, when anyone recites the work of another poet, you go to sleep and are at a loss what to say. But when someone utters a strain of your poet, you wake up at once, and your soul dances, and you have plenty to say. For it is not by art or knowledge about Homer that you say what you say but by divine dispensation and possession. Just as the Corabanthian worshippers are 
keenly sensible of that strain alone which belongs to the god whose possession is on them and have plenty of gestures and phrases for that tune but do not heed any other and so you ion when the subject of homer is mentioned have plenty to say but nothing on any of the others and when you ask me the reason why you can speak at large on homer but not on the rest i tell you it is because your skill in praising homer comes not by art but by divine dispensation okay let's pause there for a moment so there's socrates's second long speech and there he's explaining a little bit more about the role of that second ring and third ring. So there he made his case for the divine dispensation or the, the possession of Ion. And this is after hearing Ion say that he's watching the audience and calculating if he's going to make a lot of money or not. So that didn't seem to stop Socrates from saying this. Do you think Socrates made a compelling argument here? What do you think, Jacob? So he says that he is possessed and held by Homer. Mm. Um, is he trying to say that, like, you know, it's it's not like a god per se, but Homer himself? Uh, or I'm not sure what the distinction he made here or like how he differentiated it from, you know, it just being a uh, divine dispensation, you know. Oh, uh, that was the image of the um, magnets. And so the God through the whole series draws the souls of men whithersoever he pleases. So the God is like the magnet, just as from the magnet, there's a mighty chain. So the God is the magnet. And then going backwards here, the poet then is the first ring. So Homer would be the first ring. He's the one who interprets the God. And then there's a second ring attached to that, saying that. So the idea here is that Ion is not directly inspired by the gods. He doesn't have that. Um, uh, he's not like a mystic. Right. Who's got that direct connection. But it's through Homer that he has that connection. So he's connected to the gods, but via Homer. And then the spectators, by being in that audience and being moved to tears and having that cathartic connection, they're the third ring. I guess it brings up the question of whether, you know, mm -hmm. how, how far down do you go on the ring? And still mm -hmm. say that someone is like divinely inspired mm -hmm. or if you're on the second or the third level of mm -hmm. the ring then yeah. so you're hesitant to call that divine dispensation i think because so i feel like it gets weaker at every level mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah Do you think there is some something maybe analogous to this idea of possession? Maybe in a weaker form? Do you think that, th does that explain what's going on here? It's not by art or knowledge about Homer that you're, that you enjoy talking about him. Or do you think it is by art or knowledge? I think it becomes more like art or knowledge the farther down you mm -hmm. go in the rings. Okay. Hmm. That raises the question then of then what draws him to that? Like some people are very knowledgeable about computers. Some people are very knowledgeable about Homer or Plato. Or some people are drawn to learning about art. Or some people are drawn to um, you know, there's various things. Everybody's, there's something that inspires a person. Some people just really are interested in insects and studying butterflies. Other person has no interest at all. So is there something 
um, beyond just art or knowledge to describe that or to explain that? Maybe. I, I think when you have someone that's interested in, it, in any topic, mm. at least at the early stages, um, they're influenced by their teacher. Mm -hmm. And so they aren't directly influenced maybe by the art or the, like, the science itself, but they're just getting their information completely from a teacher. And only when you get deeper into that science will you maybe be able to grasp the science outside mm -hmm. of just through the views of other people that have understood it better and could explain it to you. Okay. Yeah. Jed, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think both nature and nurture. Um, if you have an upbringing where you're really encouraged or really treated well by family and teachers when you're collecting bugs or playing on the computer, then you might love the computer for those reasons because of nurture. But then we can recognize that people tend to have a certain disposition, predisposition that they're born with towards certain things. Some are more mm -hmm. athletic than others. Some are more into, I don't know, more disposed to different sorts of things. Um, so there does seem to be some sort of magnet drawing our attention or um, skill or affinity or affinity would be the right word but that might be different from divine dispensation you can be someone who is naturally dis predisposed to computers but that doesn't mean you can get into a state where you're possessed and your soul dances mm -hmm. however that does happen in different arts, music, probably computer games, they talk about the flow state. Um, athletics, they can be in the zone where they f it feels like you're possessed and your soul is dancing. So I'd, um, we talked about a, another text last week about how people um, are predisposed to follow a certain god a certain thing that can draw you up quicker mm -hmm. that you love. Some mm -hmm. people might seek their enlightenment through um, athletics or, or escape the matrix in that way, and some through philosophy and some through dancing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder if that natural predisposition to a certain style of activity and love for it is the same kind of thing as um, the magnet that can inspire you to um, uh, these altered states of accessing knowledge that mm. you haven't learnt, the, the divine dispensation. Do you think that mm. there's, it's the same thing or they're two different things? Mm. Yeah, yeah, and you see here there's that image that um, one poet is suspended from one muse, another from another. So very similar to the idea of following a different god, that some souls follow one god and some follow another. So a very similar idea there. Do you think that the Are thing you that you're follow? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Trying to get my opinion in here. Huh? Well, do you think they're two different things, like two different chains? Like the thing that you're in, that you're attracted to is can also be the thing that you can get divine dispensation from, or is divine dispensation different from a natural tendency? Well, I would say that the natural tendency is something divine. Of course, why wouldn't it be? Yes. Good point. Okay, so let's go on here. We're getting to another very interesting point here. We're going to see that Ion is um, a little hesitant to accept this idea that his skill in praising Homer comes not by art, but by divine dispensation. 
Let's see his reaction to that idea. And that was the last line here, right? Um, okay. So Socrates, sorry, let's just be clear here. Socrates ended his speech by saying, your skill in praising Homer comes not by art, but by divine dispensation. I, I'm wondering then, seeing as we're studying philosophy, if we have a natural dispensation towards something that we're attracted towards, or we could say that we love, does that mean philosophy is not open to everyone because we be, people might be more attracted to different things? Well, I think you'll find that there are many different spiritual systems or many different ways, like everybody feels drawn to questions like, um, why are we here and what am I? And we all have this, or, or we're all at least open to having that sense that there's more to me than the physical. And when people do feel that those questions and do feel like an emptiness, like, is this really all? You hear all these stories, you know, of people who, um, who had great success financially or got even famous and, but it's empty. They get everything they dreamt of and then they realize it didn't give them the satisfaction they thought it would. Um, like, um, and then so, okay, I'll just leave it at that. And so they go looking for something. And then I think if at that point, um, we are drawn in different directions. Some people will go away towards the way of philosophy, but other people will find that dry and they'll want to um, go a more emotional way, a way that deals the, through the emotions and feeling gratitude. And some people want to um, experience the divine through art or through doing something with their hands, you know, something physical. There are many different spiritual paths and we're drawn to the one that I think fits us the best. Um, but what you'll find is that whatever path you enter through, it's going to lead you to all the others. You can't have a complete... To, to, be the, to reach the point of being a sage, you have to have an appreciation for all of the paths. Even the person who's turned off by philosophy initially will eventually, if they stay in it long enough and they do it with integrity, they're going to appreciate the philosophy because the, their experiences will relate to it. Whereas, on the other hand, the person who's um, drawn to philosophy may think that like the practices of um, gratitude are kind of hokey and weird and, you know, we're turned off by all that emotional, silly, fuzzy stuff. But eventually we appreciate it because through the philosophy, we come to see the value of why gratitude is something significant. And, and it's same with all of the paths. They all eventually emerge or merge together into one. Mm. So, answer your question. Well, that sounds like what we were describing earlier with uh, mm -hmm. the different types of critics, um, mm -hmm. how we gave different stages to be able to talk about a certain painter then mm. to be able to talk about a sculptor mm. then to be able to talk about a painter a sculptor a dancer also mythological mm. fig figures mm -hmm. throughout history that last stage seems to be that stage which encapsulates all of them and so i wonder if while socrates is talking about having a divine dispensation for one particular thing i wonder if there is a a path or an art mm -hmm. that does incorporate all of them allowing you to talk about all of the poets all of the inspired people but keeping in mind they're a ring below the god if we elevate it one step you could say well that person at that last stage who's able to talk about all the different artists, they would therefore be a spiritual thing where you'd be able to talk about all spiritual traditions because all of those artists are ringed down from the main one, which is the, the God. So to be able to talk, um, to expound on 
how well their successful works are would be to talk about how well they encapsulate the uh, message mm -hmm. from the God. Therefore, you'd have to be able to speak about all those traditions that you mentioned mm -hmm. with maybe mm -hmm. understanding, uh, uh, maybe, maybe divine dispensation isn't enough at that level. Maybe that's what Socrates is talking about, where you need art and understanding and knowledge as well to be able to hit all of the different ones. And if that's mm -hmm. the case, then we could hierarchically rank this spiritual tradition greater than all of them in that it encapsulates all of them. Mm -hmm. And then we might actually be able to ask the next question, do all the other ones eventually filter into that last one? Yeah, I'm going to partly hold off on addressing that until we get to the end, because there's still more pieces of the puzzle to fill in before we get before we get to that discussion. I think you're jumping a little ahead with that. Uh, I will just point out, though, that um, having an appreciation for all these <clears throat> different, excuse me, <clears throat> having an appreciation for these different um, avenues is not the same as being an expert on all of the writers, for example, who have written poetry, or <clears throat> um, having an appreciation for, say, bhakti yoga, which is the yoga of um, the heart, doesn't mean that you're necessarily an expert on all of the yogis in that tradition. But it means that you appreciate what they teach and you can see the wisdom of what they're teaching. You don't have to necessarily be able to discuss them the way like an academic expert who majored in that area of study would be able to talk about it. So whereas what he talked about the artist, it did include a little bit of that sense. So, but there is a sense in which what you're saying makes um, sense then and I want to come back to that later so I'm going to hold off on that so what I'm not disagreeing with what you said there is a sense in which I agree with it I just wanted to clarify that it has there's a difference between seeing the wisdom of these various traditions versus being able to discuss it intelligently as like this speaker and this speaker or this artist and this artist well isn't that the same puzzle that we would face mm -hmm. in what Socrates mm -hmm. is talking about with the ideal critic or rhapsode um uh, like how can somebody be able to talk about a flute player and a painter mm -hmm. and a sculptor? Wouldn't he have to spend years and years studying each of the individual ones to be able to talk mm -hmm. on each of them? Well, if you are, if you're, you're talking about the sage, then when they, if you show them the works of this, oh, this is what this person's ideas are. This is what they taught. The person can look at that and see if it's wise or not. Oh. It doesn't mean that they're an expert on that whole tradition, but they can certainly look at that one thing. Like Socrates certainly could hear the ideas of another philosopher and tell you if it's right or wrong. Oh, okay. So for the philosopher or the sage, there is a higher principle that they're all touching on. Mm -hmm. And there'd be some equivalent with art, like a painter and a sculptor and a musician are all, uh, there is a principle that they're all doing and, and the apparent differences are uh, insignificant to somebody who can see that and therefore can talk on each of the different ones. Well, if you know the nature of reality and you know truth, then when you see the artist's work, whatever it's expressing, you're going to see what it's expressing wouldn't you oh i see so if i'm a musician but know nothing of painting but know the nature of reality i can see a painter and say oh okay this person fell short of it, of encapsulating the true nature of reality and talk about why true mm. potentially Oh, okay. I think it would help to know a little something about art, but if it's expressing something, um, I think to some degree you're going to see it. So it wouldn't be about brush strokes per mm -hmm. se. The person who can speak on each of them wouldn't be talking about brush strokes. He'd be talking about something higher that is equally applicable 
and significant to painting as it is to sculpting, as it is to music. I'm saying that there are there there are things that I think are specific to painting, and someone who does know about art will appreciate the brush strokes and so on. And like I know nothing about music, you're very knowledgeable. I have no idea um, if somebody is um, is playing music in a you know which um, note they're playing in, which key. Um, I have no knowledge of any of that. And so you can talk about music in a much more intelligent way than I can. Um, if something touches, uh, like when you're listening to classical music, for example, there's a certain, it, it, it touches your energy in a certain way, and you don't have to be knowledgeable of music to recognize that. So it will touch on the, that area that you know. If you know the nature of reality, you're going to recognize that in different arts. But it doesn't mean that you can necessarily talk about that particular art with the level of um, knowledge of a person who has studied that art. Right. So mm -hmm. notes and keys or brush mm -hmm. strokes are kind of lower level material mm -hmm. physical things. Learned, that to I which they people who study that it's something meaningful but <laughs> well ahead. i mean even to the people who study that like mm -hmm. y y like a musician would say okay yeah it's it, you know it's good to know about keys and stuff but really mm -hmm. the reason we play music is this mm -hmm. other thing to be able to touch mm -hmm. the divine and to touch the soul mm -hmm. of your audience perhaps and whether or not the person is successful at doing that someone who knows the nature of reality and knows what it's like for the soul to dance. They could say whether or not the musician was successful or not, or it was too long or it didn't have enough symmetry. Maybe there are some principles like symmetry that apply to all of them. Mm -hmm. And, and using those, that language uh, mm -hmm. of, of inspiration of soul and maybe concepts like symmetry or beauty or proportion that touch on e all of them, that would be the higher part of the art. Mm -hmm that mm. somebody who had that could talk about sculpting, painting, and music without mm. knowing about keys. Mm, perhaps. Yeah, let's hold on to that question because I think we're jumping ahead, okay? But at this point here, um, Socrates tells Ion that his skill in praising Homer comes not by art, but by divine dispensation. Well spoken, I grant you, Socrates. But still, I shall be surprised if you can speak well enough to convince me that I am possessed and mad when I praise Homer. Nor can I think you would believe it of me if you heard me speaking about him. I declare I am quite willing to hear you, but not until you have first answered me this. On what thing in Homer's story do you speak well? Not on them all, I presume. I assure you, Socrates, on all, without a single exception. Not, of course, including those things of which you have, in fact, no knowledge, but which Homer tells. And, and what sort of things are they which Homer tells, but of which I have no knowledge? Okay, let's pause there for a moment. So Ion rejected this idea that he, he praises Homer not by art, but by divine dispensation. Seems to be Ion's image from looking at his, his statement here. What is his image of divine dispensation? He calls it possessed and mad. Mm, maybe he just has a negative connotation that he's, mm. you know, putting there. Although mm. I think it's a higher form to mm. be divinely p possessed would mm -hmm. be, you know, you're closer to understanding that, that science mm -hmm. if mm. you are able to be in that state. Right. Yeah. So the idea of being possessed or being mad has, there's two sides to it. 
and he's taking it in more of the negative way. And he's saying that he has knowledge, and he doesn't want to give that up. He's not willing to give that up, to say, no, he's knowledgeable. Um, he says here, um, if you could hear me speaking about him, you would see I'm in my, my, I'm in my right mind. And then now we're going to get into a very curious section here where Socrates is going to question him to find out what exactly is he more knowledgeable about. So um, on what thing in Homer's story do you speak well? He says everything. And, but are there, are there not things in which you have no knowledge? And he's like, well, what sort of things are those of which I have no knowledge? So he's claiming to have knowledge of everything. And Socrates is going to very, um, very slowly here, pull it all apart. So, um, sorry, where did we end off? Did we read Eons? Socrates, mm -hmm. why does not Homer speak a good deal? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. There are a lot of people around who mm -hmm. claim to have knowledge of everything. Like you said, pastors mm -hmm. last time. Um, I call them professional opinion havers. <laughs> they uh, consider themselves experts in everything. And often they become politicians, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. But uh, could we say, like, if uh, if Ion is saying, well, if you see me give speeches, you won't call me divinely dis inspired. And earlier he mentioned um, uh, uh, not being completely enraptured and having his eye on the um, uh, mm -hmm. the states of mind of the audience. Could it be that that Ion fails at both? What Socrates is talking is the higher understanding and knowledge and dispensation. And he's like rubbish at both. Well, that's a, that's the question to hold on to till we get to the end. All right, so let's pick up here with Socrates. Asks him. Sure. First art. Mm. Why does not Homer speak a good deal about arts in a good many places? For instance, about chariot driving, if I can recall the lines, I will quote them to you. No, I will recite them, for I can remember. Tell me then what Nestor says to his son Antilochus, advising him to be careful about the turning post in the horse race in honor of Prot Protocolus. Bend thyself in the polished car slightly to the left of them, and call to the right-handed horse and goad him on while your hand slackens on his reins, and at the post let your left-hand horse swerve close so that the nave of the well-wrought wheel may seem to come up to the edge of the stone and yet avoid to touch. Enough. Now... Ion, will a doctor or a charioteer be the better judge whether Homer speaks correctly or not in these lines? A charioteer, of course. Because he has this art, or for some other reason? No, because it is his art. And to every art has been apportioned by God a power of knowing a particular business? For I take it that what we know by the art of piloting, we cannot also know by that of medicine. No, to be sure. And what we know by medicine, we cannot by carpentry also? No, indeed. And this rule holds for all the arts, that what we know by one of them, we cannot know by another? But before you answer that, just tell me this. Do you agree that one art is of one sort and another of another? Yes. Do you agree this as I do, and call one art different from another when one is a knowledge of one kind of thing and another a knowledge of another kind? Yes. Since, I suppose, if it were a knowledge of the same things, 
how could we say that one was different from another when both could give us the same knowledge? Just as I know that there are five of these fingers and you equally know the same fact about them. And if I should ask you whether both you and I know this same fact by the same art of numeration or by different arts, you would reply, I presume, that it was by the same? Yes. Then tell me now what I was just going to ask you, whether you think this rule holds for all the arts, that by the same art we must know the same things, and by different art things that are not the same. But if the art is other, the things we know by it must be different also. I think so too, Socrates. I think it is so, Socrates. Then he who has not a particular art will be incapable of knowing aright the words or works of that art? Words or works, true. Then will you or a charioteer be the better judge of whether Homer speaks well or not in the lines that you quoted? A charioteer. Because I suppose you are a rhapsode and not a charioteer. Yes. And the rhapsode's art is different from the charioteer's? Yes. Then if it is different, it is also a knowledge of different things. Yes. Now, what of the passage where Homer tells how Hecamede, Nestor's concubine, gives the wounded Macoan a posset? His words are something like this. Of Permenian wine it was, and therein she grated cheese of goat's milk with a grater of bronze and thereby an onion as a relish for drink. Is it for the doctor's or the rhapsode's art to discern all right whether Homer speaks correctly here or not? For the doctor's. Well now, when Homer says, quote, and she passed to the bottom like a plummet, which set on a horn from an ox of the field, goes in haste to bring mischief among the ravenous fishes. End quote. Are we to say it is for the fisherman's or for the rhapsode's art to decide what he means by this and whether it is rightly or wrongly spoken? Clearly, Socrates, for the fisherman's art. Then please observe, suppose you were questioning me and should ask, since, therefore, Socrates, you find it is for these several arts to appraise the passages of Homer that belong to each, be so good as to make out those also that are for the seer and the seer's art, and show me the sort of passages that come under his ability to distinguish whether they are well or ill done. Observe how easily and truly I shall answer you, for he has many passages, both in the Odyssey, as, for instance, the words of Theoclaminus, the seer of the line of Malamemphis, to the suitors, quote, hapless men, what bane is this afflicts, afflicts you? Your heads and faces and limbs below are shrouded in night, and wailing is enkindled, and cheeks are wet with tears of ghosts. The porch is full, and the court full of them also, hastening hellwards neath the gloom. And the sun is perished out of heaven, and an evil mist is spread abroad. End quote. And there are many passages in the Iliad also, as in the fight at the rampart, where he says, quote, For as they were eager to pass over, a bird had crossed them, 
an eagle of lofty flight, pressing the host at the left hand and bearing a blood-red monster of a snake, alive and still struggling, nor had it yet unlearnt the lust of battle. For bending back, it smote its captor on the breast by the neck, and the bird in the bitterness of pain cast it away to the ground and dropped it down in the midst of the throng and then with a cry flew off on the wafting winds End quote. this passage and others of the sort are those that i should say the seer has to examine and judge And you speak the truth, Socrates. And so do you, Ion, in saying that. Now you must do as I did, and in return for my picking out from the Odyssey and the Iliad the kinds of passage that belong severally to the seer, the doctor, and the fisherman, you have now to pick out for me, since you are so much more versed in Homer than I, the kinds which belong to the rhapsode, Ion, and the rhapsode's art, and which he should be able to consider and distinguish beyond the rest of mankind. Is Socrates throwing down here a little bit? I mean, Ion's whole thing is being able to remember and recite Homer, and... Here Socrates is just laying down passage after passage of quotes. What's going on? Apparently he knows a few of them too. Mm. But we have just a few more pages to go and we're almost out of time. So I'd like to get to the end and then we can have some discussion. Okay. What I say, Socrates, is all passages. Surely do you, you do not say all, Ion. Can you be so forgetful? And yet forgetfulness would ill become a rhapsode. Why? How am I forgetting? Do you not remember that you said that the art of the rhapsode was different from that of the charioteer? I remember. And you also admitted that, being different, it would know different things? Yes. Then by your own account, the rhapsode's art cannot know everything, nor the rhapsode either. Let us say everything except those instances, Socrates. By those instances, you imply the subjects of practically all the other arts. Well, as he does not know all of them, which kinds will he know? Those things, I imagine that it befits a man to say, and the sort of thing that a woman should say, the sort, of, the sort for a slave, and the sort for a free man, and the sort for a subject or for a ruler. Do you mean that the rhapsode will know better than the pilot what sort of thing a ruler of a storm-tossed vessel at sea should say? No, the pilot knows better in, in that case. Well, will the rhapsode know better than the doctor what sort of thing a ruler of a sick man should say? Uh, no, not in that case either. But he will know the sort for a slave, you say? Oh, yes. For instance, if the slave is a cowherd, you say the rhapsode will know what the other should say to pacify his cows when they get fierce, but the cowherd will not. That is so. That is not well, so. Well, well, that's not so. That doesn't make sense, Socrates. <laughs> well, the sort of thing that a woman ought to say, a spinning woman, about the working of wool, no, not that either. But he will know what a man should say when he is a general exhorting his men. Oh yes, that sort of thing a rhapsody will know. Well, 
But is the art of the rhapsode the art of the general? I, at any rate, should know what a general ought to say. Yes, since I dare say you are good at generalship also, Ion. For in fact, if you happen to have skill in horsemanship as well as in the lyre, you would know when horses were well or ill managed. But if I asked you, by which art is it, Ion, that you know that horses are being well managed by your skill as a horseman or as a player of the lyre? What would your answer be? I should say by my skill as a horseman. And if again you were distinguishing the good lyre players, you would admit that you distinguished by your skill in the lyre and not by your skill as a horseman. Yes. And when you judge of military matters, do you judge as having skill in generalship or as good rhapsode? To my mind, there is no difference. What? No difference, do you say? Do you mean that the art of the rhapsode and the general is one, not two? It is one, in, to my mind. So that anyone who is a good rhapsode is also, in fact, a good general? Certainly, Socrates. And again, anyone who happens to be a good general is also a good rhapsode. Uh, well, no, no, there I do not agree. But still, you agree that anyone who is a good rhapsode is also a good general? Oh, to, to be sure. And you are the best rhapsode in Greece? Far the best, Socrates. Are you also, Ion, the best general in Greece? Ah, to be sure of it, Socrates. And that I owe to my study of Homer. Then how, in heaven's name, can it be, Ion, that you, who are both the best general and the best rhapsode in Greece, go about performing as a rhapsode to the Greeks, but not a general? Or do you suppose that the Greeks feel a great need of a rhapsode in the glory of his golden crown, but of a general none at all? It is because my city, Socrates, is under the rule and generalship of your people, and is not in want of a general, whilst you and Sparta would not choose me as a general, since you think you manage well enough for yourselves. My excellent Ion, you are acquainted with Apollodorus of Cyzicus, are you not? What might he be? A man whom the Athenians have often chosen the, as their general, though a foreigner, and Phanosthenes of Andros and Heraclitus of Chalzomeni, whom my city invests with the high command and other offices altogether. Oh, sorry. Whom my city invests with the high command and other offices, although they are foreigners, because they have proved themselves to be competent. And will she not choose Ion of Ephesus as her general and honor him if he shows himself competent? Why, you Ephesians are by origin Athenians, are you not? And Ephesus is inferior to no city. But in fact, Ion, if you are right in saying it is by art and knowledge that you are able to praise Homer, you are playing me false. You have professed to me that you know any amount of fine things about Homer, and you promise to display them. But you are only deceiving me, and so far from displaying the subjects of your skill, you decline even to tell me what they are, for all my entreaties 
you are a perfect Proteus in the way you take on every kind of shape, twisting about this way and that, until at last you elude my grasp in the guise of a general, so as to avoid displaying your skill in Homeric lore. Now, if you are an artist, and as I was saying just now, you only promised me a display about Homer to deceive me, you are playing me false. Whilst if you are no artist, but speak fully and finally about Homer, as I said you did, without any knowledge, but by a divine dispensation, which causes you to be possessed by the poet, you play quite fair. Choose, therefore, which of the two you prefer us to call you, dishonest or divine. Hmm. Well... The difference is great, Socrates, for it is far nobler to be called divine. Then you may count on this nobler title in our mind's ion of being a divine and not an artistic praiser of Homer. Okay. Thank you both very much. And there are some very difficult memes in there, so I appreciate that. Um, Okay, so Ion ends without really being convinced that he's divine, right? He just says it's far nobler to be called divine. He would prefer that. Doesn't mean he's really convinced. And of course, I don't imagine he sees himself as dishonest either. So he doesn't seem really convinced by either argument that Socrates made here. Um, how do you feel about the ending here? Jacob, what is your idea here? Do you think he comes across as somebody who does indeed have art and knowledge, or does he come across as someone who has divine dispensation, or neither? So maybe if I let go of my conceptions of, of art and knowledge a little bit, uh, then I would say, you know, Socrates convinced me that it is divine dispensation. Mm -hmm. And I think when like Homer is, you know, directly, you know, connected to the muse, he can speak on all of these different uh, sciences because, you know, he's connected to the truth in a sense. And when you claim to be in, you know, as Socrates says, if you claim to be an expert on Homer, then you'd have to be, you know, an expert on all these things that Homer talks about. But that would be difficult to to be that way. I I my guess for like what the rhapsodes uh like how their art could be defined maybe is is closer like to a dialectician or someone that can you know, like an actor or a dialectician, maybe. Okay. In in what way? Just that you know how to, you know, repeat the appropriate uh, phrases that you know are going to be like, you know, pleasing to the crowd versus okay. the ones that are going to be the most spiritually, like, you know, poignant for them. Kind of like sophistry. Is that what a dialectician does? Well, they're more, I would say, a dialectician in the sense of like someone who's just concerned with how effective their argument is and not their, uh, the moral consequence of their argument. Oh, uh, that's a very lower use of dialectician than what we use, in the, the way Socrates uses it or Plato. Hmm. Maybe that comes out of Aristotle, but. Okay, the way we use it is something more like the philosopher, like what Socrates does. And there has to be a certain vision of truth to guide his questions. So you're using it more as like the way he might use like a rhetorician. Okay, that's what I meant. Like that. That's Yeah, okay. I should have used rhetorician instead mm -hmm. of dialectician. Then. Okay, so we're on Thanks. the same page. Mm. Yeah. So you see Ion is something of a rhetorician. I think so. Mm -mm. Okay. 
What are your thoughts, Jed? Hmm. Um. Ah, uh, I. The ending is kind of <laughs> bizarre. He's he's struggling as a rhetorician even at the end, um, contradicting himself and. Um. Although all the way through he, he um. He keeps saying yes. What you're saying is true. He keeps repeating that phrase. So he is functioning as though he has that vision of truth that you just mentioned and is using that to judge Socrates in each step of the way. So that's weird that he's doing that, which is supposed to be Socrates' job, and Socrates is giving these quotes from Homer that is supposed to be Ion's job. I don't know what that means, but it's weird. Mm. Mm. Well, in that, um, where, which page was that on? The summary was um, page 429. Let me go back a bit here. Um, oh, it was further down. Sorry. Um, where was it? He gave... Oh, yeah, here. He says, You, the rhapsode and actor, are the middle ring. Okay, so, the, sorry, the spectator is the last ring. The rhapsode and actor, like Ion, would be the middle ring. The poet, such as Homer, would be the first ring. And then the muse is the magnet. Is the artist anywhere in there? Isn't it curious that this is about the artist, and yet he's not there? Or do you see him there? Sorry, Jacob, do you see him there? I, d I don't see that. I don't see him there. I mean, is, is he there? Is, is he actually in there? Or is he just like someone that, you know, studies it for the sake of themselves? Like if they're not, I don't know, getting it from someone else? Yeah. I don't know if they're, they're there or not. Yeah. This is kind of a trick question. Isn't the poet? Huh? Isn't the poet the artist? He's writing poetry. Is that creating like a song? Oh, but the one who creates is not the artist. It's the judge, remember? The artist is the one who has knowledge. Not so. Remember, the contrast was between being an artist and having divine dispensation. The poet has divine dispensation, and then uh -oh. Ion is inspired by him, so he has a second. He has, or he has divine dispensation once removed, and then the spectators are moved by Ion, and so they have divine dispensation three times removed. So there's the single god, the different mm -hmm. gods, which we could call the muses, that have their different mm -hmm. motivations magnets. and mm -hmm. magnets, yeah, pulling people in their own ways. And then under the muses or lesser gods, we have the the creator of the thing, like the poetry. And then under mm -hmm. them, we have the rhapsode or the preacher. And then under mm -hmm. them, we have the... The people showing up on Sunday to give their money. Mm. Um, and we're saying the artist isn't on there. Mm. What do you make of that? Does Socrates comment about the divine dispensation as being part of his art in any text? Oh, we're in, we're in this subtext. I mean, in this text? Sorry. Yeah. He like, never defined he... it. But he contrasted it as the... He, he presented it as the contrast to the artist. The closest, I think, maybe he came to defining it is where he introduced it here. A poet is a light and winged and sacred thing and is unable to indict or compose until he's been inspired and put out of his senses. So you're 
inspired, you're put out of your senses, your mind is no longer in you. Every man, while he retains possession of that, is powerless to indict a verse or chant an oracle. And then a few lines later, he called that divine dispensation. And inside a verse doesn't mean the same as when Socrates is quoting the verses, because he quoted many verses. Hmm. He's talking about creating yeah. one from scratch. Yeah. yeah. Indict means to compose. So maybe Socrates is reciting all his quotes using a different mental faculty as Ion is when he recites them. It, or Ion doesn't have it either, and he's just doing it from, they're both just doing it from memory. Mm. Or has, but that's very different from what Homer did in creating the, the Iliad. In the Odyssey. Right. Well, what about so uh, Socrates never wrote anything down, but could there be a, a, a muse and a chain that philosophers and Plato mm -hmm. was following in writing the Ion? In other places, he or Socrates says that he was a follower of Apollo. Plato never told us who he was a follower of. So maybe there is a chain for the artist, but a different chain, and maybe we can hierarchically rank which is the better chains. Let because me throw he... another idea out at you. I'll hold on to that idea. Um, coming back here, where he gives us the image, of the spectator is the last ring, the rhapsode or actor is the middle ring, the poet is the first, the god or the muse through the whole series draws the souls of men, whether he pleases, that's your magnet. Who's looking at it? Who's, who's seeing all of this? I mean, somebody has to see the magnet and the rings attached to it, like a bird's eye view to see it all recognizing this pattern is that the artist <laughs> okay makes sense to me okay okay is the one who sees it that makes sense why we didn't see them in in the rings so would and that make for, no, go ahead. would that make the artist the ring above the muses that the muses attached to Oh, no, no one's above them. <laughs> well, if there are different muses, there has to be a singular cause. Mm -hmm. Like if there, are, if there are many different muses, mm -hmm. there must be a higher principle above them. Mm -hmm. mm. And would that be the vantage point from which you can see the different muses with the different rings? Well, I think what it comes down to is what is knowledge, really? Because we talk about knowledge of being a, a chariot driver or knowledge of medicine, or knowledge of spinning wool. We're using knowledge in a much lesser way than what you want to use it as when you're asking about that higher art. Are any of those subjects, say like um, spinning wool or driving a chariot, are those really in the realm of knowledge? Only in that higher sense, if you're, if you're um, spinning wool in order to, I guess spinning wool is, in the, is a better, if you're... Is there anything uh, in the cave that is in the realm of knowledge? Not in the cave, no. No. And those things are in the cave, would you agree? Yes, but didn't we talk about like painting or music can be used to uplift the soul? And so mm. while the physical key is in the cave, the mm. higher aspect of it is outside. Mm. So those are the things that the person who would understand all of it would know, because those are the things that are out of the cave. So like what I was saying before is that the, a person can recognize what is 
wise in the music without necessarily knowing the stuff in the cave, the exact notes or, right? Right. So there are certain crafts like weaving wool that don't reach out of the cave, but then maybe there are certain things like painting, sculpture, and music that um, do have like one arm outside the cave reaching for that. And the extent to which it does that well, the person with knowledge can judge because he can see the outside of the cave. You can judge that aspect that is out of the cave. A person can get in the zone while spinning wool. Doesn't mean that spinning wool is out of the cave. So there is a difference there. Right. But then like a, a good like basketball coach or, or the best mm -hmm. basketball coach, um, mm -hmm. they often say is like would be the one who d would be able to understand that because ultimately that's his job to somehow create mm -hmm. the conditions for the excellence of the champion athlete to, to be in his mm -hmm. highest state. So if they understood that, they would be the better coach. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. Or they would you know, certainly have to have you know, right opinion. At least. And enough to recognize that right. state of mind. Right. And, and right. like uh, mm -hmm. baseball players have their own mock understanding mm -hmm. when someone, like when a pitcher is in the zone, you can see him sitting at the end of the dugout and everyone else is over that side and no one's allowed to talk to him. And if, you know, there's stories of rookies who are like cheering him on and they get yelled at because we don't talk to him because they don't understand that state, but they recognize that it's the best thing in baseball. Mm -hmm. They don't understand it. So they're just trying to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. So a true, someone with the uh, knowledge and the art might be able to understand what he's doing, how to get there better, how to maintain it, etc. Yeah, I don't know. A person has to be like a Socrates to coach, to be a good coach, but there has to be at least that right opinion, of that recognition, like you're saying. Yeah. Right. And if, but if there are many muses, mm -hmm. would that necessitate there to be a singular source above them? Well, and understand, we were saying before, last week that like the philosoph the philosopher is the highest art. Philosophy is the highest art, the art of the arts. So I think that's the one you're getting at. So, so the, 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 the God that mm -hmm. the philosopher has his rings attached to would be the one that's above all the other muses, that the muses get their equal kind of... Because if the muses have a similar power and structure and principle, there must be something above that more primary. Could that you know be what who, the... Do you know who is the god above the muses? Zeus? Kronos? I'll give you a hint. He's the god that Socrates follows. Apollo? Yes. I thought the Zeus was the... And the muses follow him. Oh, I see. So uh, Apollo is op often represented as like um, in the 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 listing of the twelve Olympian gods as mm. at the bottom. Mm. Um, but and yet his name means not one. Isn't that curious? He's the most. Name... If you go from the most, he's the last of the twelve. This is the way Plato has organized it. At least in Plato's organization, different philosophers may have different organizations. But um, Zeus and Hestia are at the top, and it goes down to the most differentiated, with Apollo as the last, and his name means not many. Isn't that curious? Yeah, what does that mean? I spent a long time figuring that one out, but you can figure it out. We'll talk oh. about it next week. Tell so, me next, tell me came up with. Okay, so we're saying that in that particular way of using the gods, he's at the bottom, but there's another way of understanding mm -hmm. Apollo as mm -hmm. above all the other gods. He has a certain function. Oh, wait, hang on a second. Let's Maybe I'm confusing... 
maybe I'm confusing gods and muses. He's not above the other gods, but he's above the other muses, and that would yeah. be different. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I see where I made my mistake. Mm. But of those 12 gods, why is he the last, and why does his name mean not many? So we'll leave it at that. But anyway, yes, Socrates follows Apollo, and Apollo is above all of the muses, and so the art that um, recognizes all the arts is philosophy. So what would be the highest in the individual chains uh -huh. is actually the second rung of Plato's chain because it's attached. So the muse is attached to Apollo. Mm -hmm. So therefore Socrates can look down and see all the other chains mm -hmm. and describe them to Ion. Hmm. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah. Ooh. I like that. Okay. And we'll end it there. Um, any last thoughts, Jacob? I didn't mean to leave you out of that one. We went on a oh, little yeah. bit of a I back like and forth there. Okay. All right. And thank you both also for your reading as well and your comments. And then from next week, we are going on to the Gorgias. And again, we will use the lobe, and I will put a link in the description box for a PDF of that. And Can I ask before we wrap it up? Sure. Um, we started by saying that Socrates was going to make two speeches. Mm -hmm. We got the second one today where he talked about why he falls asleep when people talk about other poets. What was the first one? Well, Socrates' two speeches were the first one was when he introduced the magnet and the poet as the first rung. And the second speech was where he went more in detail about the second ring. The, and this the, is why you have divine dispensation. Oh, the Rhapsody's mm. ring. Yes. Oh, okay. So he was fulfilling out the thing. And he also said, by the way, the proof of this is you, this is why you fall asleep. Yes. It's an interesting um, proof through a negative. <laughs> Indeed. Mm. And okay, um, do we comment? Could we comment about Ion's like um, pers personality, wanting to be a, thinking he's a should be a general, and how dangerous that can be, and how he's unwilling to follow the arguments and. Well, as long as he's not a general, I'm not scared. And this uh, uh, Proteus. Is he mm -hmm. the same guy that's been talked about in the other talks that, oh no, no, that's the moving statue. Oh, that's Daedalus. Daedalus, right, mm -hmm. right. So we've got <laughs> Daedalus and Proteus mm -hmm. as kind of like um, uh, metaphors or to, to make fun of people. Mm -hmm. the shapeshifter. Uh, uh, yeah, Proteus is the shapeshifter. So, so mm -hmm. when somebody keeps reneging on their arguments, you can call them a Proteus. And, yes. and when someone's trying to claim that um, that they're not responsible for their actions, you can call them a Dadius because no, they're moving no. others or something mm. <laughs> while being a statue. Mm. Their statues are running away. Yes. Yeah. I feel like we're okay. missing some historical context or something around Ion <laughs> or maybe he was in a battle or some, why he thinks that about generalship. Yeah, that is curious. That's very curious that he could read this. He reads Homer, and so he thinks, no, now he can be a general. Yeah. Thank you all for watching this on YouTube. I thank both of you for going through this with me. I find it very helpful to go through them again, so it's for me as well. And um, next week, then, we go into the Gorgias. So I do hope that all of you watching this on YouTube will join us for that. Thank you very much. So long. <laughs>